Good morning. This is uh, Bruce Schmidt. Hey, I'm Bruce. Burley County Ex- Ag and Natural Resource with the Extension Connection. And Uh-oh, it sounds she's here. like we are being joined in the nick of time. Oh, yeah. Here. Wonderful. Chandra, how's it going? Hey, good. I'm so excited about the topics today. Did you already get that started? We're just no, starting. Just oh, started. Cool. We, we were going to wait for you, but we knew that there was people out there that don't like dead air. So <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm one of them, actually. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so I don't know about you, Bruce, but I'm excited to share a little bit about some things that I've heard this canning season, getting some of that food put up that you've grown or even just purchased a lug of peaches or what have you. And I tell you, I do talk about food preservation throughout the season a fair amount, but I'm just getting so many calls again. I just wanted to share a couple things that I'm hearing about, like sure. oven canning. Don't you do know, it. Don't you know? do it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so is that just the word? Don't do it? Yeah, that's okay. it. Okay. So canning is all about making sure that you're doing it safely. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I also want to, in celebration of a couple flag holidays coming up. We just wanted to talk a little bit about the flag etiquette and how to show respect for the flag, especially for those, um, I think, Columbus Day coming up and then mm-hmm. especially Veterans Day. Boy, That's is that in one. the news? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know. Except in a, in a poor way. Right. You know, yeah. It's really unfortunate. Day, it can be so positive, too. When our office got delivered a, a, a replacement flag mm-hmm. and it was not folded it was just kind of oh. bundled. In the office, you say? Yes. Mm, and it was just like, you know, I, I'm not a veteran, but right. I, I respect all those. Yeah. And when I see that, you know, and I can only imagine what veterans would Well, my uh, dad was experience. a Navy man, and he taught me how to fold the flag. Right. You really need two people to do it properly. Right, yep. right. You really yep. do. Yeah. Yep. I can that remember, nice tight uh, triangle. You mm-hmm. know, and that was one of the things I, I learned during 4-H at mm-hmm. 4-H yep. camp. Right. Uh, you know, we actually... It got you know if you got picked yeah. to uh, either raise the flag or, or bring it that's down. that's right and, it was kind of neat the, to be picked yeah, yeah. Scouts and, uh, are good about yes, that too. very good so now curious Bruce in that memory did you have you know a team of two people that were picked or four or you know do you remember at that time you know when it, it would it depended on the uh, size of the four right acres. right um, how old were they you know were, if yeah. they were the age but. Uh, we usually try just to have the two and and do it just like you know, mm-hmm. like you said, you know, the the traditional and, mm-hmm. and uh, one and one and right, yes. right. Well, neat. So, what do you got on tap? Well, today? you know, we we actually I got my first call on frost, uh, mm. and it okay. was in, from Grand County. So we're going to talk about you know the forages that still might be out there and what we can do. And yeah. maybe I'll just run with this right now. Yeah, I'm really curious, uh, too, about this subject. I, I was very surprised because, you know, it was a beautiful evening last night, but again, it was clear. Yeah. And we are, you know, knocking on October's door. So oh, yeah. when you think our, our average frost is somewhere around the 25th, we're, we're right, right on track with okay. that. Okay, the 25th of September or yes, October? September. Oh, okay, yeah, sure So, enough. And, you know, some of us are looking forward to a a frost, the killing, uh, slowing down of, I, I look at it, I'm not going to have to mow my lawn right. much more. I know. You know yellow I'll jackets. Have, I yeah. want the yellow jackets to go. But you told me that a light frost will just kind of tick them off. Yes. Uh, mm. they, they become a little more aggressive oh, as uh, they know that their their time is, is coming. So They want to go out in a blaze of glory. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and even for our forages, a light frost is more difficult to manage than a killing frost. Because the uh, the whole thing that happens with our sorghum sedans and millet, especially, is the prussic acid, when it's frosted, okay. it comes up in the stock. Now, it, when it comes up and we have a killing frost, the plant will naturally dry down. Once the drying down happens, five to seven days, it's safe to go out there and graze. Right. With a light frost, it comes up, but the plant doesn't dry down. Right. So we have a a lot longer hmm. and a lot more uncertainty. So on light frost, we're saying maybe pull or, or avoid grazing for about two weeks, mm-hmm. which again, uh, many of our ranchers are using our sorghum sedans and millets as a, you know a last resort because of the drought conditions. So that is going to be a uh, 
a little more difficult. So the, the best thing that we can say is when we're having these light frosts, let's get them off uh, after a killing frost. Uh, we can go uh, five to seven days, but if you're going to uh, – and if you're going to hay it or cut it, then just make sure it's dry. Because once that plant is dry, the risk of the acid, prussic acid, is diminished. So mm. a couple okay. things, and, and as we get closer to that time, uh, you know, we'll be probably running some PSAs or uh, at least put it on our Facebook to kind of give a reminder. But uh, it's something, like I said, we're at that point yeah. now. Let's start being aware of it. Mm -hmm. Well, do we see in the forecast at all? I don't know if you've watched if they predict that it'll actually get down you know, in it, our county early. It, it looks like we're, we're going to have the, the 40s through the evening. So, mm. um, okay. again, uh, with it, you know, and, and we've gotten some Not good quite. moisture. And, uh, you know, and, and again, that, that all helps uh, right. know, with, with our plants and their, in any kind of uh, concerns that we might have. So mm -hmm. I think today is going to be a gorgeous day. Yeah. Yes. So. Hey, that's a positive attitude yeah. there. Right. Which, you know, and which kind of leads into our vegetables, you know, right. our gardens. They're, yeah. they're winding down. I'm going to pick the last of my tomatoes because I'm just, yeah. I've got You're enough. You're just done. Mm -hmm. I'm just done. Okay. And uh, then and my wife is going to do some salsa. Hey, okay, okay. Great. Uh, Salsa. She doesn't know that yet, so this might be a... <laughs> Real nice of you. <laughs> well, okay. So, you know, and we can get into a little bit about canning after the break here. But interesting you talk about tomatoes, Bruce, because I want to share something that comes up quite often. And so a lot of folks don't know that when you go to can your food, what we mean by that is you want to make it stable on the shelf. So you don't have to use your freezer. You don't have to use your refrigerator. That has to be done in a way that renders the food safe. Mm -hmm. And some of our old recipes aren't safe, regardless if you've been doing it for a long time. And, uh, you know, I... You know my saying, Bruce, but a couple Aprils ago, we got together as Family and Consumer Sciences agents in Fargo, and we did some training, and one of the food scientists said, you know, old recipes, using them for canning is kind of like walking across the interstate blindfolded. You're going to get across most of the time, but when you get hit, it's catastrophic, and that is how it goes. Yep. Exactly. And so remember with tomatoes, and we're about to take a short break here, tomatoes are one of those that are not anymore naturally acidic enough. Years ago, they used to be. Mm -hmm. And I asked our food scientists and, you know, dietitians in Fargo, our specialists, well, you know, I'm hearing that because I remember growing up that they always said tomatoes are acidic. Well, some of the breeding of the plant seeds has worked we've, that out worked of the heirloom tomatoes it. and things. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yep. so none of the tomatoes that we typically grow, and we have research to support this from our Williston Research Center, none of the tomato strains, the common 20 that you'll grow, are acidic enough to just water bath can. So we'll talk about that after the break. Right now, 53. The Red River Farm Network. Ag News is here on Super Talk 1270. All right, welcome back to Extension Connection. This is Chandra Zeman Belinsky. I'm the Family and Consumer Sciences Agent from Burley County this week here and joined by Bruce Schmidt. Thanks for introducing it last section. Yeah, no problem. Last now we we were before break, we were just starting to uh talk about the tomatoes and mm -hmm. how are tomatoes because of the uh the new varieties mm -hmm. uh, you're telling me are, are not acidic enough right so this is going to change right. our right um, yeah canning. method yes. really okay mm -hmm. that's interesting and so very important there are really only two ways to can food safely one is by your more traditional water bath canning. Correct. And the other one is just as traditional but not as widely used because people are seem to be afraid of it. And I always like to give as many uh, pressure canning as the other method, water bath versus pressure canning. Mm -hmm. I like to give as many pressure bath uh, canning demos as I can throughout the year. As a matter of fact, I have one today. And that's because I like to show, I mean, the last one I gave was last week, Tuesday, to the Bismarck Garden Club. We were in the basement of the library, and I just took my little burner and my pressure canner and got it up and running. I mean, so you can do it in the basement of a library. You, you can know. do it anywhere, though. You sure can. And so, okay, now, how do you know what situation to use water bath versus pressure canning? 
Right. This is kind of the big question here. And the answer is the natural acidity of the food that you're canning. So it's all about the microbes that, you know, live in a, a jar of sealed food. And so the one that we're really worried about likes to be without oxygen, sealed in the food product. But the problem is that's Clostridium botulinum. I don't even want to get scientific about it, but it, that's the one. So if you want to check it out, we know that that has a special survival mechanism. It, it creates spores. And those spores aren't destroyed until 240 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm-hmm. So we know that with the water bath canner, it's not gonna be cold. you can't get up to it because you're, you're boiling at about 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm-hmm. And so what you have to do is you have to add pressure or you can take the acidity down to a safe level to be able to water bath can. And that's by adding lemon juice, Concentrate, not fresh squeeze, but lemon juice because we want to know how much is in there. A tablespoon or two at a time, you have to follow a recipe. Or vinegar. Okay. You can also use certain types of um, powdered forms of, of ascorbic acid or citric acid, depending on the recipe. So while I'm talking about recipes, I really, please, one more thing I want you to get out of this. Make sure that you're using an accredited recipe source. Okay, so those three are... And, you know, for the most part, you've got to be careful with magazines because they have great suggestions. But make sure that it's from an extension university because we do the testing to make sure that, I mean, we literally make the recipe, put little electrodes in to double check the the internal thermal temperature as the process is, is working through to make sure it gets up to 240 degrees. And... Um, so, you know, we're the ones who, the, the universities are the ones who do that research. Also, USDA slash FDA, our government um, food protectors, basically agencies, they do some research as well as Ball, okay. Ball and Kerr. So we can okay. use those three recipe sources. So, which would be a, another good reason of right. why we need extension offices. That's right. Because That's right. you can go out there, or I could go out there, and I could probably Google any kind of tomato paste salsa recipe, but I would have no way of knowing unless it's, right. you know, the site uh, would, you know, right. give if credit it's... to uh, you yeah, know, if the, they the, recognize the sources it. Right. that you had just said. You're exactly right, Bruce. And so, like I said, I mean, I love certain websites where they give you craft ideas and recipe ideas. It's really the way that I plan my holiday meals because I always like to find fun sides. Sure. But when it comes to canning, you want to make sure that you're in that food safety area and passing. And so the only way to really do that is to double check your recipe. Mm -hmm. And those research universities are, are where it's at. Right. And the reason is because we're not trying to sell you jars or sell you lids. And, you know, so we're we're anti-biased. You know, I mean, not to say that you can't go out there and Google our sites and Kerr and Ball and and get recipes. Right. That's still approved. Right. It's approved. Just make sure that you're tracing it all the way back to its origination. That's exactly right. Great Aunt Betty's uh, tomato recipe. Yep. Made, you know, made up in her head. I mean, even if it was, I guess if it was um, University of Georgia, Georgia or something years ago, we actually like to double check recipes when it comes to canning every three years, because literally it's amazing. You know, I, I was a food scientist in the meat industry for quite a while. And it was, you know, listeria is a big one that you hear of this one, especially if pregnant women have to be careful of their sliced meats. And listeria lives in the ground, in the soil, actually. And it can be very catastrophic for especially certain high risk populations like folks, you know, children, people that are um, in the aging population as well as people who are pregnant. And we also know that listeria is one that we want to watch in the in the meat industry so that we implement checks, safety tests to make sure that it's not there. And so mm-hmm. that's, you know, I even managed that program for a while. So that's hence quality assurance. So those are the good cops in, in, right. The, right. in the plants. And so listeria. In the meantime, I had gone and, you know, I had taken a food microbiology class from Kansas State. They have great food microbiologists down there. They have also good recipes in their extension service. And um, they had told us about the four main 
species of listeria. And here, literally six months later, we had we had found six more strains in six months. Just an example of how things can change quickly once mm-hmm. the research is published. Right, mm-hmm. and with the technology that we have, and you know, and we touched on that also because I know when you look at the horticulture side, how our you know the advances in yeah. different types of tomatoes uh, because totally. cause what we're trying to do is we're trying to make a better product at the end right. more consumer friendly uh, you know disease resistant uh, all of these things and that changes the makeup yeah. of, of our yeah. plants. Yeah, so. that's a good point. Exactly what happened with essentially with the tomatoes and how they're no longer acidic enough to just be canned without acid. So mm-hmm. either you need to add lemon juice or vinegar. We have the recipes on our website. So go ahead and use your f- favorite search engine or give us a call. Um, search engine to check out our website. Uh, just type in Burley County Extension, or you could call us at 221-6865, and I'd be happy to answer those questions. Leave a message, and I will get back to you. So um, I think we're going to be okay, because I know she puts in... Some some acid. Yes. So Excellent. Okay, now, if you don't, you need to follow a pressure canning recipe mm-hmm. that has been tested. So it's either acidic enough, or you've got to get that up to a 240 degrees somehow, and the way to do that is with pressure. So people ask me, can't I just boil it for a long time? And actually, it's an unnerving amount of time. It's days that you would have to water bath can and monitor that. And so we, it's just not recommended, so we say a reasonable amount of time. So you need pressure in order to get it up there. And so, you know, a couple of things that are important to, when you're looking at your recipes now, and of course you want to make sure it's a good source re- mm-hmm. of, for the recipe, but make sure that you're paying attention to the size of jar recommended. And specifically for salsa, I have yet to find, so prove me wrong if you've got it, I've yet to find an approved source recipe for salsa canned in anything bigger than a pint jar. Um, Quart jars, not approved for home canning. And that's because it holds more product. It takes longer to penetrate that center of the really, especially thick salsas, Mm -hmm. um, to the center of of the food product. It has to get up to 240 degrees for an amount of time. And so you've got to use pint jars, for example, with salsa. And so that a size of jar or smaller, that's right. So, you know, you've got your half pints, your jelly jars and things like that. Yep. Um, But you should use what the recipe calls for. And then also, please note, one of the biggest mistakes that I have, so think fermentation making pickles, okay? So with pickles, a lot of folks don't realize that even if you've, cooked your your brine and your and poured it over the pickles which is considered a hot pack because you can either raw pack or hot pack um, so you've hot packed your pickles you still have to water bath process them after you put the contents in the jar most common mistake friends so please follow the recipe so regardless if you know your typically your pickles are hot packed you still have to water bath can them and there are ways to make sure that they stay crisp you know so Mm -hmm. you and that is missed so if you don't you you have yourself probably a refrigerator pickle they cannot be shelf stable so quick question before we go to a break okay um we have a pressure canner yes yeah but i don't know when the last time the gauge was oh good question Riz. so would i bring it to you right okay actually most all of the counties, um, you'd have to double check where you live, but you know Morton County, Burley County, most of our listeners, I know there's one up in McLean County, your NDSU extension office has verification um, tools to make sure that your canner is accurate, your pressure canner gauge. There are two types of pressure canners. Uh, weighted gauge and, and dial gauge. And if you have the dial, you need to check it once a year okay. to make sure that it's accurate. All right. Well, we're going to take a break and then we'll get into a little bit about how to fly your American flag. Right now, 53. Dave Ramsey is heard here. Super Talk 1270. 
All right. Welcome back to Extension Connection. You've got Burley County this week. Uh, every other, we share time with Morton County. Now, I have Bruce Schmidt, Ag and Natural Resources Agent. Hi, Bruce. Hello. And then myself, I'm Chandra Zeman Belinsky, and I am the Family and Consumer Sciences Agent in Burley. We talk a lot about food preservation. If you have any questions about, you know, making grape jelly, the grapes are about to come and do here. If you have raspberries, tomatoes, peppers, please yeah, check out our website. Kind of winding down, yeah. So now's a good time to yes to get brushed up. That's right. And so, if you are somebody who has used an old recipe for years, make sure that it's still a safe recipe, okay? Because we're constantly updating our understanding of microbiology. You don't want to get caught with an old recipe. Just make sure that it's it's still safe in the amounts that you're using, and we can we can yeah, at least verify some things with some examples that we have for you. So check out our website, Burley County Extension, or call us at two two one six eight six five. Now uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit in basically in celebration of upcoming, you know, some flag holidays, specifically Veterans Day, and then I think we also have actually while well, we we're should, talking about we it. Have- Columbus Day. Yes. Um, there are flag holidays. Okay. And so I'm going to use a great resource here that is a brochure from the National Association for Family and Community Education. This is a an organization that's nationally recognized that was very strategic in getting school lunches and your schools back in the 60s. And right. so they lobbied in you know, Washington. And I mean, they do many community services oriented things. So that's called FCE today. It was homemakers years ago. Yep. yep. Those yep. started 100 years ago as canning clubs. Canning clubs, homemakers, now it's FCE. FCE. And we are always taking new new members. Uh, we do lots of good community service things. Okay. So the National Association every year brings out about three different new you know, training topics. And okay. this was done uh, several years ago, and they used resources such as the Etiquette to the Stars and Stripes from the VFW, as well as the Flag of the United States from the American Legion. And so they've compiled some good resources into their own pamphlet, which I'd be happy to share with you if you're interested. Um, so we're talking about, the subject is, um, you know, basically how to show respect for the flag. And we want again. We want to do that because there are actually nationally recognized flag holidays, mm-hmm. and so the first one is New Year's Day. That you should always display your flag on this day, if you you know if you have one. But there's a proper way to display display the flag. Okay, let's get into the inauguration day, which was January twentieth. Okay, Lincoln's birthday, Washington's birthday in February. There, Easter Sunday. It, it could be variable, but okay, so that could be variable. But they suggest Easter Sunday, Mother's Day, second Sunday in May, Armed Forces Day, which is third Saturday in May. A couple things in May, and then also Memorial Day. Um, And here's something interesting. Memorial Day, friends, you actually want to display the flag, fly the flag at half staff until noon, the last Monday in May. And so those of you who know me in the last few years know that one, you know, one particular Memorial Day I spoke at at the Capitol and there were a lot of our uh, state leadership there. And, you know, there is some history behind why it's the last Monday in May. So it's always Mm -hmm. last Monday in May. Uh, But I didn't realize that half staff until noon for Memorial Day. Okay, a couple more. Flag Day in June, June 14th. Independence Day, of course, in July. Labor Day, first Monday in September. Constitution Day. Now, we just had Constitution Day, Bruce, September 17th. So we should have had our flag out there, Yes, Uh, at least at my house. Columbus Day is coming up here, second Monday in October. And, yeah. Did we we jump over Father's Day? Uh, Good point. But we have Mother's Day. Good point. I might have to write to someone, (laughs) but that's okay. I'm going to stay neutral here. I don't know. (laughs) That's interesting. I'll check that out. Some of those dates, uh, I mean, that I'm I'm kind of surprised. Uh, I didn't realize. Yeah. uh, you know, it's a good reminder of, you know, Very some of good. the history of our flag. And so then, you know, the one that I thought of to bring this out today was Veterans Day, November 11th. Sorry about this. For some reason, I skipped over Navy Day. 
October 27th. So I could say, because, you know, I'm in the Army. Why isn't yeah. there an Army Day? Same as Father's Day. I'm not sure why. We might have we might have some issues here. Uh, well, okay, so Veterans Day, November 11th, is always, and then Thanksgiving Day, the fourth Thursday in November. Those are the flag holidays, and you can check those out online if you if you need a repeat. Um, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into the, a little bit of the history of the flag and how it originated. And so... Before we go yeah. into that, okay. as I'm thinking of those dates that you read off, now, there is certain things with as far as the weather, isn't there? Like, yeah. you know, if yep. we've got uh, a rain especially, is there special things we're supposed to do? In, yes. Uh, yeah, there is. When displaying? Okay, so I tell you. Okay, so it says, fly me proudly and properly. As if, now I'm going to read this as if I'm the flag. You know, it's like the flag okay. talking. Okay? okay. So just a, a little bit of, you know, respect. Uh, and so fly me properly. So let's actually get into that and then we'll get into the history. Because this is the stuff that's really interesting to know. And, and so I will answer that in just a moment. I want to talk about what the flag represents as far as the organizations and the government that, that really have developed these guidelines. And even as the dawn of our country in, in you know 1776 I'll get into mm-hmm. that sure. but what I represent as the American flag I symbolize national independence and popular sovereignty of power I'm not the flag of a reigning family or royal house in the United States of America but a flag representing free people blended into one nation united by feeling and purpose okay mm-hmm. um, a nation distinguished by liberty and a pursuit of happiness, safeguarded by principles of righteousness and pursuit of happiness, safeguarded, I'm sorry, that's a repeat, I guess, and justice for all. Okay, Okay. so pursuit of happiness, safeguarded by principles of righteousness and of justice for all. I had to turn the page and it was on there twice. So I'm the spirit of patriotism. I'm the spirit of the American nation. Kind of neat. Um, mm-hmm. So that's written in. Mm-hmm. So it says, fly me proudly and properly. And so really, I'm not getting into a choice that people make in displaying their patriotism. That's your choice. And fortunately, we live in a free country. Mm-hmm. But I'm just going to stick to the um, really the unbiased how to fly your flag properly. Okay, right, right. and so that's where I want to go with this. Fly me probably properly. Number one, fly me only from sunrise to sunset okay. on buildings and on permanent flagpoles in the open. However, you can display me 24 hours a day for patriotic effect if you light me up at night. Okay. So there has to be a light on the flag. And so a lot of people choose to either either the light can come from above or even from the ground kind right. of as a spotlight shining up on right. the flag. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you'll see that. So if you see a flag flying at night and it's not lit up, feel free to very respectfully, and I, I repeat that, respectfully you can communicate that because a lot of people don't know that. Right. And so it's up to us to maintain the standard. Mm-hmm. Okay, number two, I should be raised briskly and lowered with ceremony so you don't want to take your time bringing it up and and you will see the guys that know what they're doing gals um you know they really run it up the flagpole um so and then lowered with ceremony now i don't have an elaboration there on the ceremony so you'd have to look up the resources that i mentioned earlier if you're interested i think it costs 10 bucks for the the flag etiquette book from vfw if you wanted to buy that online Um, Number three, on bad weather days, use me in an all-weather form, Bruce. Okay. Okay. So so there are, you know, the the cotton cloth probably isn't the best, you know, versus a polyester, a nylon specifically. I know that when I was deployed with the Army, we had a lot of nylon flags that we flew so so that we could give them out as – Thank you gifts and things. So if you're if you fly in a war zone, there's some there's some um, patriotism there. Number four, display me daily on or near the main administration building of every public institution. And so I know we have a flag Bad out flag. at our um, yes. building. Yep. And so schools, schools, courthouse, mm-hmm. public library. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, kind of uh, neat thing to know. When number five, when you carry me. In the front of a parade with other flags, I should always be to the marching right of the other flags or to the front and center of the flag line. 
Okay. Number six, I should never be carried flat or horizontally, but always aloft and free so that it can freely flow. Okay. So okay. I should never be carried flat or horizontally. You do see this sometimes on parade uh, floors. Okay, especially in games and things like this. So it's a good reminder for mm-hmm. for those of us who want to respectfully pay this understanding forward to, you know, folks that don't, you know, aren't aware of it, basically. Right. Number six, I should never be carried. I'm sorry that I said it. I'll say it again. Flat or horizontally, but always aloft and free. Number seven, in a ceremony of raising or lowering me or when I pass in a parade or review, all civilians present should face me, the flag, and stand at attention with the right hand over the heart. And so standing attention is basically your hand over your heart. I mean, if you really want to get technical, put your heels together, okay? And your your toes are kind of 45-degree angle apart. <laughs> if you're, you know me, my military. <laughs> so the military salute to me in a moving column should be given at the moment I pass in front of you. All right, a couple more minutes here, a couple more things, and, and we'll get into a little bit more about the flag, especially in uh, we have Columbus Day coming up, mm-hmm. Navy Day, and yep. uh, Veterans Day. So number eight now. When displaying me with another flag, okay, displaying versus the parade that we talked about, I should be on the observer's left and my staff should be over that of the other flags. And so you will see this. So if you you see, you know, three flags, like think the American flag versus, and I say the United States of America flag versus the state flag. State flags. Right. uh, The USA flag is a little bit taller, typically, Mm flagpole to cover that. Yep. so I should be on the observer's left and my staff should be over that of the other flags. Good to remember. Number nine, do not let me, the flag, touch anything beneath me, such as the ground, the floor, water, or merchandise. I, I think most people know that. Don't yeah, let the flag I fall on the ground. I think there's a lot of respect for that. Too. Yeah, yeah. Number 10, I should be a distinctive feature of a ceremony for unveiling a statue or monument. But I should never be used as the cover for the okay. statue or monument. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Number 11, we've got uh, about 20 things here. So we're about half done now. By order of the president, I shall be flown at half staff upon the death of principal figures of the United States government and the governor of a state, territory, or possession as a mark of respect to their memory. So mm-hmm. memory of, of things that's happened in government. Um, number 12, I should never be used as clothing, never festooned, drawn back, nor up in folds. I should always be allowed to fall free. Bunting should be used for decoration. Okay. Um, so that one, it's a little bit difficult to understand. You can look up in the reasoning in, in some sure. of our resources. Okay. Number 13, I should never be fastened displayed, used, or stored in such a manner as will permit me to be easily torn, soiled, or damaged. Okay. Okay. Well, let's take a break, and we will get back to the last few, how to pay respect to the American flag. Sure. Right now, 59. News and Views with Joel Heitkamp. Weekdays on Super Talk 1270. All right, welcome back to Extension Connection. I'm happy to be here to uh, talk about a couple of subjects today with Bruce Schmidt. Yep, um, and we've been talking about flag and flag etiquette and flying. And, you know, there's there's a lot of things that as we're going through this, I, I kind of can see some gray areas that we, myself included, have gotten a little lax on. Right. Um, you know, I, I know we try to put the flag up on, on our house, you know, when it's, uh, you know, right. one of these you know, flag, flag flying holidays. holidays. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, yes, so let's pick up. We were about, uh, we've got about 20 different uh, yeah. uh, points as referring to as oh, yeah. Fly uh, flag, me proudly and properly, it flag says. Flag speaking. Yeah, as if the flag is, is talking here. And so we get into this subject just because we're about to celebrate a couple flag holidays. And I thought it would be fun to share a resource from our family and community education um, uh, publications and that is yesterday's homemakers and before that canning clubs we were talking about canning so it's kind of a good segue sure. and so we're not getting into any of the subject behind people displaying their right to you know uh, 
their pursuit of happiness, which is ultimately what the, the flag represents. We're just reminding you of how to fly and respect the flag properly. Okay, so there's about 20 of these, and we were on number 12. I should never be used as clothing, never festooned, drawn back, nor up in folds. It should always be allowed to fall free. Bunting should be used for decoration. So I said that one. And then I, I'm sorry, I said number 13 too, so that it should never be stored in a way that it could be easily torn, soiled, or damaged. Okay, sorry. Number 14, friends. So never hang or drape me in any position below the seats on a platform. Number 15, I should never be used as a table cover or receptacle for for receiving, holding, carrying, or delivering anything. Okay. Um, Number 16, I should never have placed upon any part of me nor attached to me any mark, insignia, letter, word, figure, design, picture, or drawing of any nature. Okay, so let's read that one again. I should never have placed upon me any, any part of me nor attached to me. So basically, display the whole flag as a whole. Don't do parts of. Right. You know, mark, the insignia, the letter, the word, figure. Okay. Drawing of any nature. So that one, again, if you have questions, you might need to go to the resources with um, the VFW or the American Legion, which is the resource for these. Number 17, when I am used on a casket, I should not be lowered into the grave nor allowed to touch the ground, which was one before. Right. So after I've been used as a casket cover, I may and should be displayed in every normal manner. Number 18, never destroy me in public ceremony. When I'm so badly torn, soiled, or faded that I'm no longer a fitted emblem for display, I should be destroyed in private, preferably by burning and without ceremony. If torn, I may be, amend- or may be mended, and if soiled, I may be washed or dry cleaned. Okay, two more here. Number 19, when displaying me either horizontally or vertically against a wall, or against, uh, I'm sorry, so when displaying me either horizontally or vertically against a wall, my union should be uppermost and to the observer's left. Okay, so that union is the the blue part. The blue part, Mm -hmm. right. Should be uppermost and to the observer's left. And so if these are displayed, um, especially horizontally, um, tilt that, the blue portion up just slightly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number 20, I should never be used for advertising in any manner whatsoever. I should not be embroidered on such articles as cushions or handkerchiefs and the like, printed or otherwise impressed on paper napkins or boxes or anything that is designed for temporary use and then discarded. Wow. So, um, you know, who makes these rules? Well, any rule or custom about displaying me, the flag, may be changed or repealed, or additional rules may be made only by the President of the United States, acting as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. Any such change shall be set forth in a presidential proclamation. Now, this is kind of um, one of those old respectful messages here. So when when the president makes a proclamation, he starts by saying, hear or she, uh, hear ye, hear ye, be it known from this time forward, blah, 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 president of the United States of America. Okay. Kind of interesting. Okay, so friends, do with that what you will in a teaching and respectful manner. Please do not um, disappoint us by, by, you know, being difficult about the message. Please just share this with the folks that are younger or just not knowledgeable. Okay. You know, and like you said, as we were reading through this, uh, there's some some excellent points. Uh, you know, the, and some of that I, I guess I would probably mm-hmm. take a little, a couple steps further to yeah, make sure you really understand see, it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because uh, being part of the um, this summer, I was asked to be. Uh, one of the flag holders as the right. um, Bismarck Larks, right. uh, one of their opening. And I was the National Guard had the uh, the flag that basically took up the whole uh, infield. Hmm. And it was such an honor, you know, and, and we were really careful because we wanted to make sure we had enough people. It was one of those typical North Dakota days with about a 15 mile an hour wind. And, yeah. and you know, we were hoping to have some uh, youth to help hold the flag. We wanted it to be, you know, uh, across the board. And But then at the same point, we were thinking, boy, if the wind caught this just right. Yeah, it's like that a would parachute. Be, you know, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
that was, you know, something. A little we concerning. Didn't even, we didn't even want to go down that right, road. Right, so, right. Um, Thank you know, goodness that didn't happen. But it was, right. you know, again, it was uh, um, the uh, National Guard um, that were there present. Mm-hmm. Uh, they talked us through it really well. And mm-hmm. I, I, there's so much, you know, uh, when we think of it, you know, sometimes we just take some of these things so for granted. Right. And we forget about the history and, and everything behind right. it. So. Right. And, you know, this was also on my mind in celebration of Veterans Day coming up. But also we have a very alive and, and very healthy family and community education uh, group of individuals in Burley County. We have about 40 members. And really they focus on giving back, a citizenship type mm-hmm. type focus where they give back to their communities. And so um, I was going to say that we have our, we have two council meetings every year. I usually give a program at each one and our council meetings tomorrow. So of course, if you're interested in becoming a member of FCE, uh, because the publication that I used to share this information was was from the FCE National Association. If you're interested in becoming a member, please call me at 221-6865 and we can get you into a club. And they do some really good stuff for the community. So you said you have basically three programs or that you do each year, and this would be one? Well, um, two, two, two. But they have three publications that as okay. a national member, you would you would get a copy. Okay. Um, so that's kind of neat. It's part of your so membership. So not to put you on the spot, but yeah. the programs this year are? Actually, I'm not sure because they're – newly distributed here so i'll we'll find out at tomorrow's meeting so that's kind of okay so sorry i don't have that answer but um you know some years it might be how to you know talk to your teens about limited um, wireless you know okay. we, we seem to be too connected some days you know how to break away from that how to how to talk to your teens about that subject i mean so all kinds of different things. I think we're, this is actually Hearth Fire Series number 11, publication number 11. And I think we're up to early 60s now. So okay. there's quite a few of them and, and they go um, in chronological order. So, all right. Well, um, you, you know, Bruce, I'm just curious here. Should we talk about the history of the flag or do you want to get into? No, let's, let's, Let's go into that. I think we're we're kind of approaching okay. the end. So yeah. Let's just kind of yeah. We'll finish this off here. And, then... and and so some of you know this because I remember learning this in grade school, and this resource is pretty close to what my memory has. But so, do you ever wonder what how the flag was born, the American flag? So it was after July fourth, seventeen seventy six, which is our Independence mm-hmm. Year, um, is when the colonies declared their independence from England with the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The people wanted a national flag as a symbol of their new spirit of unity. And so um, basically it has gradually gone from the original Union flag to what it is today. So there was there back the Union flag was 13 states. So there were stripes, um, 13 stripes, and they mm-hmm. alternate red and white. And... Um, White on, and my union should be 13 stars. I'm sorry, 13 stars, white on a blue field. The meaning of my colors, let me just read it here so I don't screw it up. The meaning of my colors are white stands for hope, purity, okay. and innocence. And red in, in the stripes are hardiness and valor. Blue is the color of heaven for reverence um, and, and loyalty and sincerity and justice and truth. So... Um, we're about to take a break here, but my stars represent power and independence as well as high hopes for the future. So just some very patriotic stuff. All right, well, let's take a break and we'll, we'll talk about planting trees in the fall. I'm excited to hear about that. It's fine. You've been listening to Extension Connection on Super Talk 1270. News and information from NDSU Extension Service and representatives of Morton and Burley County Extension offices. Tell your friends to listen in for the next Extension Connection exclusively here on Super Talk 1270.